I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's Rooted in the Mountains, hosted by Western Carolina University and the Culturally Based Native Health Programs. Also supported by uh, the Cherokee Studies Program here, uh, College for Health and Human Sciences, uh, and, and a variety of other uh, entities here, uh, along with uh, our partnership with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and uh, we've been doing this now for a little over a decade, and this is the first time we've done it in this particular format. We usually have two full days of speakers and networking and food and uh, camaraderie, uh, but we're going to do a teaser today. We'll have three of our speakers that will be uh, talking on panels uh, in the spring, April 8th and 9th, uh, if we are able to meet on campus uh, physically, uh, we will uh, have an extension of all of these discussions. Uh, but I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, I'm Lisa Leffler, uh, Director of uh, Native Health Programs at Western Carolina. Uh, helping me today is Pam Myers, who is uh, in the social work department and is working with us to help bring uh, these webinars. Frank Hatachurian, our IT person. Uh, and then we also have three of our uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Tom Belt, who is an elder from uh, Cherokee Nation. Uh, he will be talking about the traditional uh, perspectives of uh, Ama or water. Uh, Jerry Miller, uh, who is here at Western North Carolina, I mean at uh, Western Carolina University, and Tommy Cabe, who's an enrolled member uh, for the, uh, of the EBCI and works for the Natural Resources Department. Uh, I'll give them further introductions in just a little bit. First of all, I want to acknowledge that Western Carolina University uh, sits on the ancient homeland of the Cherokee people. Uh, they have uh, lived there for more than 12,000 years. Uh, we have ongoing uh, archeological sites uh, on and around uh, the university that continues to reflect the rich uh, history of the Cherokee people. This was a place uh, even 10, 12,000 years ago, it was known as a place of learning, a place of teaching, and that legacy continues today. Uh, we are honored uh, by being able to um, be on the homeland uh, of the Cherokee people, to continue to work with them, uh, to see them as our close neighbors. Uh, we honor them and their ancestors, and we continue uh, to grow and learn from them. Um, I will also would like to um, dedicate this year's uh, Rooted in the Mountains to a very dear friend of ours who recently passed away unexpectedly, uh, Mr. T.J. Holland, who was uh, Eastern Band uh, Cherokee enrolled member from the Snowbird community. He was their cultural resources officer and had helped uh, us for many, many years in Cherokee studies and with the Native Health Program uh, conduct all sorts of activities uh, to help us understand more about the, the history uh, and the significance of Cherokee cultural sites. Uh, so we dedicate this, um, this year's Rooted to him. And he will be with us every year as he helped with Rooted in the Mountains every year. Um, the Culturally Based Native Health Program uh, here at WCU is a fully online certificate program, 12 credit hours, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. Uh, this was a program that um, was developed with a partnership of the Eastern Band uh, back in 2004. Uh, we had focus groups for a year uh, that helped uh, guide and direct the development of the curriculum of this program. Uh, and uh, it went online in 2005, and uh, uh, we still uh, uh, really relish 
uh, the fact that we have so many people with expertise in our area uh, with the Cherokee that continually help us uh, with these programs. The, um, today, the, the formal presentations will start with Tom and then we'll move to Jerry and then uh, Tommy Cabe. So I wanna thank all of the presenters uh, for their time, for sharing their expertise about uh, water, this very important and sacred element uh, that we all uh, rely upon. Uh, Tom Belt being our first speaker. Tom is a member of the Cherokee Nation. He's a former Cherokee language instructor here at WCU, recently retired, but he's still incredibly busy. Uh, he's a fluent Cherokee speaker. He attended the universities of Oklahoma and Colorado and taught Cherokee language also at Cherokee Elementary School for about seven years before coming to WCU. He's a frequent guest lecturer at universities including Duke, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, Purdue, Stanford, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale. He also works as a consultant for the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia and for the Center for Native Health. Tom is also a member of the Smithsonian Institution's Na Native Culture and Health Work Group. Uh, Tom, if you would like to um, present and then we will uh, field all questions from participants at the end of the third speaker. Thank okay. you, Tom. Okay, uh, thank you for, um, for asking me to be a part of the uh, Rooted in the Mountains uh, webinar today. Um, uh, um, um, I do it with great, um, um, with great humbleness and, and, uh, and, and gratefulness to everyone and also in memory of my good friend, uh, TJ Holland. It is the uh, custom of our people to always begin any kind of uh, uh, interaction between people to acknowledge not only uh, uh, our gratefulness for each other and our and our gratefulness for being here, but our gratefulness to the uh, gifts that have been given to us by by a greater power, whatever that we um, uh, refer to that is. Um, uh, as uh, in the um, in the tradition of Cherokee peoples um, and also other indigenous peoples, we um, we commonly refer to that higher power as the uh, creator of all things. So, very quickly, uh, if uh, we could do that, it it would be of great benefit to um, the whole project here or or the uh, whole process. So. Uh, this is what we say in our language. Uh, Thank you. Um, with the uh, um, in the uh, in the way in which I would like to uh, begin this process, the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, webinar for today, we are talk. We um, I was given the responsibility or the uh, instructions to talk about uh, as much as I can with you about the uh, Cherokee uh, perspective of what we. Um, call in our language ama ama is our word for water ama um, it it is a part of any uh, that uh, linguistically speaking that word is a part of 
of anything that has to do with uh, uh, water, not all liquids, but with water specifically. For example, the word ama is water, and the word for ocean is ameguo, or big water. Um, we, uh, uh, we uh, I know that uh, uh, it's in a linguistic lesson, so I'll try to refrain from going into explaining language. But the importance of water to us, uh, from we kind of have to get a uh, perspective of uh, what water initially means to us. And water for millennia upon millennia, for as far back as our uh, stories tell, speaks of water as being what we refer to as a sacred element. Um, as one of the uh, uh, basic elements that make up the world. And there is water, and there is air, and there is land. And there is what we refer to as Galalohi, or the heavens. In, in, uh, in, uh, in the past, the way in which this kind of information has been discussed and talked about um, uh, uh, has, been, has been referenced in many, many kinds of ways. What I would like to bring out or what I would like to talk about is, is, that, is, is that the manner in which we talk about things and the language we use to talk about things, as we know, and has been said, and the common uh, axiom for for things regarding language is that much is lost in translation, and this is also true here. When we talk about things from from the perspective of one culture, uh, and try to put it in the language of another culture, much is lost about what we actually mean. So when we talk about things being sacred. When we talk about things being uh, initially a cultural view of, of, of things, we automatically begin to put our own ethnocentric kind of uh, twist to it from, from uh, whatever the uh, uh, matrix society has, uh, has um, uh, kind of socialized us to think like. And so we look at those things as not being the English term for, I mean, the way that we look at things uh, when we bring up words like sacred and cultural value, it sort of makes it uh, distinguishable or different, if you will, from how the standard normal way that we look at things. But I would like to point out that the way in which we look at things from a sacred and a cultural point of view, really, uh, especially the term sacred, when we say water is sacred, we're talking about something being, in fact, scientific. If you can just parlay those two terms into one, one expression, um, when we talk about when we talk about science, we under, when we look at it from the Western European or the English perspective, we look at 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 things from the molecular level, from how it's structured. We take into consideration all the research that's been done to establish an element or or an object, and then we get the meaning of that from from, uh, uh, from that. Well, in the native perspective, it's done the same way. We've been dealing with these elements for here in these mountains for thirteen to fourteen millennia. In these thousands of years that we have dealt with and we have been here and lived with these things and put a concerted effort in trying to understand our, uh, uh, our, uh, um, our relationship with these, uh, with, ele with these elements. Because we initially know and logically Without these things, then we don't exist as a people. We have to breathe. We have to use water. We have to drink water. And then we look around and we see how water is connected to everything else. We see that plants, animals, 
that the land itself cannot survive and cannot exist in a functional, in the way that we understand it as a, uh, uh, in a livable way, unless that, that form of life will not happen. That way of living, the, the life as we know it, will not continue without an understanding or acknowledging these elements as being an essential part of that life. In fact, what I'm really trying to say is that we realize that our relationship with these things means that we are a part of that, that we are essential. We understood that we are a part of these things and that these things are a part of us. And so, and uh, we understood that without these things, we couldn't exist. So, if you, if you uh, 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 look at how Western science, what we call Western science or what's been termed natural science as it's studied uh, academically, um, from an academic perspective, doesn't that use, uh, doesn't that say the same thing? That we are in fact, we are beginning to realize, or science is beginning to realize little, uh, little things that we knew 13,000 years ago. For example, that basically we have as much salt in our system and um, uh, in our blood as the ocean has. We have those kinds of same kinds of uh, perspectives. We are related to everything and that we have as much water in us as there is or as much liquid in us uh, as there is um, uh, the, the, the same proportionately that uh, uh, exists on the earth. That tells us that we're a part of the natural order of things, that we are born of of this uh, of um, of this scientific system, or what we call the sacred system of how things work. That's the relationship. I just wanted to point out at the very beginning that when we talk about water and and land and air being sacred, we're talking about a scientific fact here. It's it's not an opinion. It's not based on. A, religious doctrine. It is a part of that, but um, it becomes a scientific fact. And it's just simply a matter of losing that kind of perspective when it switches from, lang uh, from, from one language over to the other. So um, the sacredness of it, then if we take the perspective of that a little bit, uh, I, um, we, we can talk, I, I can talk a little bit about how that uh, exists in our world. Um, for thousands of years, the very first thing that Cherokees did every day, every morning, since we lived in proximity to streams, to uh, branches, to creeks, and to uh, rivers here, if you consider the fact that the practice of our people was for everyone to go to that stream, whether it was a spring or a small branch or a river, was to go to that spring every morning and to uh, cleanse themselves, to wash themselves and to wash their hands and to wash, uh, to wash their face and to offer up a prayer to the uh, creator and a and uh, by sound making a gesture of a gesture of thankfulness to the very land and on which they were standing on and to the water for their gift of life this was done every morning this was done every morning for thousands of years it was a way of acknowledging that as soon as you wake up the most important thing to do was to acknowledge what your most important relationship was that extended your life and that added to your life. Uh, and uh, that is what we would call, uh, that is what, when we, if a person were to explain that, then uh, 
uh, it would automatically be taken, oh, well, they thought water was sacred. Well, yes, they did. And they acknowledged that they were going to use that water today. And that on that day that they would use that water to drink, to cook, to find food in, as we uh, used um, uh, the different kinds of life forms that were available to us in that stream, everything from every fish to, uh, uh, to all of the other things that existed in the water. We considered water a living being. And we were partaking of that. Uh, the water was giving us part of its life. Just as things live in the water, things also live in, in uh, uh, it was the, it was tantamount to, to the, uh, uh, to, to the life force of the earth, much like blood in our bodies is our life force. Things live in a, we have discovered over the years in natural science that, that there are elements that are in our blood that keep us alive. Uh, there are elements and, um, and uh, life forms in our blood that are essential to our being, uh, uh, staying alive every day. Just as that occurs, we also saw that there are things that live in the water that keep it clean and keep it fresh. Every fish, every snail, every organism that existed in the water uh, supported that life form. And, we, and uh, we had a symbiotic relationship with it. Our purpose was to make sure that the uh, water stayed clean that the water stayed um, as 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 uh, clean as as clean as possible. Our word for water in streams was yoganahida, which means the long person. We uh, we uh, we said that the head of this person was in the mountains that came out of the springs, and its and its feet were in the oceans. Had it flowed to, and in that, and in that life form, in that one movement from the top of the mountains to the ocean, then um, was a living, working, functioning being. It was animate. It was alive, and it was just as alive as any human being or any other life form on the face of the earth. This is what we considered sacred, but if you look at it. That's also a scientific fact. That's exactly how it works. Uh, and we knew this thousands of years ago because we lived right by them for thousands of years. The importance of water was essential to us. We understood that liquid was um, the form in which things happen. Um, the sacred elements of a human being, of, of, of ourselves involved blood, uh, saliva, tears, if you will, uh, even urine. All of these things were sacred elements and were used and were understood to be and, uh, and were watched very carefully and, and, uh, and uh, uh, considered in all of our life forms for, I mean, in all of our life, um, uh, um, um, in our uh, in the cultural aspect in which how we conducted ourselves, for example, uh, the admonition or the, uh, the the law was that was to not, uh, a, a simple thing that you couldn't spit into a stream, no matter what kind of stream it was, from a branch to a river, uh, you couldn't urinate in a stream. It was uh, considered. Um, um, it was considered wrong. It, uh, and, and so we would talk about how it was considered unclean to do that. And we were admonished not to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to do that. And, and, and as it was explained, it was a, uh, you, were, you were contaminating a, a sacred element. 
So when that was spoken and told and interpreted to uh, English speakers, that's how they took it. But what we were doing was simply saying that you couldn't contaminate the water, that you had to take care of it. Uh, and, and it brought to mind the importance of keeping it clean and keeping it immaculate. These are the practices that Native America, that Native people and, 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 uh, and uh, Cherokee people practice for thousands of years. The, uh, we understood, for example, that water was probably the, was the essential um, element of life here on earth, life as we know it. We understood that. Uh, the uh, interpretation of the word for the creator, unehanahi, the word uneha in our language uh, is a verb uh, that says one has liquid. Like uh, if you have water, uh, if, um, if uh, a member of my family had a glass of water, I would tell you ama uneha, they have water. So uneha is one of our five verb categories uh, that distinguishes between uh, things like solid objects, uh, things that are long and uh, uh, things that have length and are also solid and uh, liquid and animate and uh, flexible. And so the word for creator starts with the word uneha which means unetlanahi, which may mean, which may mean, which may have something to do with one who has water. Uh, uh, that is how far, or that is how much we, uh, we um, 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 respected and considered uh, liquid as being an important part of the world. And uh, in speaking with, uh, and in speaking with Lisa just a few days ago, um, we were discussing how uh, scientifically speaking, I guess one could say that we all originated from water, that at one time the earth was all water. We know that to be a fact, um, that the earth may have been covered with water and land, uh, uh, land only appeared uh, uh, when, you know, uh, because of the seismic events and, 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 and stuff. But um, water was uh, the uh, first, uh, first element here and that all life came from water. And we also understood then that uh, life wasn't, uh, that water was in fact the very womb that all life emanated from and 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 came from that that everything here on land plants and animals and and human beings would not be here had had it not been for uh, uh, had we not evolved um, uh, um, uh, uh, from the oceans that had, uh, that had existed here and stuff. We understand that it is a part of our origins. We understand it is an essential part of our life um, in that way. So it has a connection in our culture. It has a connection with the very beginnings of life itself. That marks it as being sacred. That marks it as being important. And being a matrilineal society, we understand the importance of that, of, of, uh, of uh, where we come from and how we how we come into this world and so um the importance of water in our culture when we say it is sacred when we say it is an important that it is a cultural value of of ours we are in fact um speaking about or trying to explain a very uh, important a uh, very important and basic scientific fact that water is in fact an original uh, element here. It is important to all life and we cannot exist without it. And that is the importance of water. That's what makes it sacred. 
if we cannot consider that as being a sacred thing, then we really have no real clue as to what water is. And it becomes inanimate and it becomes an object that can be used and, and, uh, and, uh, and discarded and not considered without any kind of conscience. But in a cultural sense, water was always, we were always very conscious and very conscientious about uh, how we, uh, uh, we um, uh, had a, uh, we're very conscientious in our relationship with water is a very important part of life. And in fact, it started every morning and um, was the first thing that you paid attention to. So with that then, um, uh, I, I wanted to add to as, a, you know, since we kind of started off on a linguistic note, the word ama, um, it always intrigued me that the Cherokee word for water is ama. And the Cherokee word for salt is ama. One is ama, water, and ama, or salt. It's basically the same word. I've always wondered if you wanted to trace that back, uh, or if you wanted to think about it from a, um, uh, 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 from an aspect of linguistic anthropology, if that doesn't somehow or another relate to the fact that we understood that we all came, that water is in fact, that salt water, the sea, if you will, and the seas that, that, that um, that virtually uh, cover the face of the earth aren't the original element here, and that all water comes from that, and it's all related. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have the same word. Salt would not be the same word as uh, water. And, and it's, uh, so once again, you have a uh, linguistic and a cultural connection with, uh, with that element of, uh, of uh, water. Um, the importance of it to our culture can't be underestimated, but it can be destroyed. It can be taken away. Much has been taken away. Our understanding of these things has, has even affected our own people where a lot of our own people aren't even aware of these concepts in this day and time. Uh, it is the way in which we socialize. It is the way in which we colonize a certain, um, uh, um, in, in how we colonize people to think of a certain way in order to, to sustain that um, colonial structure or how that uh, society works. So we too, uh, as a people, have forgotten this. And I think that at the, in, in, in this late hour, um, in the evolution of, of us and, and, um, and the earth itself, I think it's important that we try to bring back uh, and try to revive those concepts, not only among my people, not only among native peoples, but also all of the peoples of our society to the importance of these kinds of sacred cultural icons. It's very important that we revive those concepts again before we lose them. And I wanna thank, um, and, uh, uh, and I wanna thank everyone for, um, for um, uh, listening to what I had to say. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tom. Um, we appreciate that as always. Um, I think it sets the tone for this particular symposium uh, because our intention with this symposium every year is to show um, the integration of traditional knowledge with environmental and health issues and how um, these are not, as we do in the academy, we often silo these into disciplines or silo these types of thoughts, um, but they are indeed 
interconnected. And uh, this, again, is another clear example how um, these ideas and these, uh, the language uh, and all of these, these concepts that you shared uh, are indeed things that um, integrate our thinking and our behavior, uh, both to understand more about our environment and our health. So thanks again, Tom, for kind of setting, setting that foundation for us, and uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I know that we've got a couple of questions. Um, if, if you all will just um, uh, continue to send those in, uh, Pam will field those, and then at the end of the presentations, we will address these questions. So thanks again, Tom. Our next speaker is Dr. Jerry Miller. Uh, since 1999, Dr. Miller has held the position of the Blanton Whitmire Distinguished Professor of Environmental Science at WCU. He received his PhD from Southern Illinois University in Car Carbondale in 1990 in geology, specializing in hydrology and geomorphology. He's conducted research locally, nationally, and overseas in the areas of river and wetland restoration and the transport, fate, and remediation of contaminated rivers. Dr. Miller has published numerous articles and refereed professional journals and is the co-author of several books, including Process Geomorphology, a textbook used now in its fifth edition. So thank you, Dr. Miller. We really appreciate your participation uh, and we look forward to uh, your contribution to this discussion. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. And we'll see if we can bring up a PowerPoint presentation here. Guess you're able to see that now. I'm not quite sure how um, how well Zoom's going to work. So as Tommy outlined, or Tom outlined, many of the important aspects of water and why it's so critical for us on a daily basis. What I've tried to do here on this slide is to just kind of outline some of the important ways that we currently use rivers and river waters. We're probably all aware of these particular uses, but although we don't necessarily think about them on a daily basis. So for example, our rivers provide food, the water within the rivers are used for agriculture, irrigation of agriculture, used to produce power, of using various types of industry, and they provide a, a wide range of uh, recreational opportunities for us. We use a lot of rivers for drinking water supplies. In fact, the drinking water supply for Western Carolina University comes from the Tuckasegee River. But just as importantly, rivers are uh, and represent an extremely important uh, ecosystem and they provide a host of ecological services. In fact, we can look at the uh, Little Tennessee River in Macon County and it's one of the most diverse uh, ecosystems in the United States and perhaps even the world. And so what we're going to try to do today is provide a, a slight overview of two questions that I commonly get asked. What, one is what is the current status of our streams and rivers, in particular river waters? And then secondly, are things getting better or worse? Now, we commonly think that um, our river, rivers are in a pretty bad state and they're getting worse. And there's certainly some truth to that. Although the answer to these questions is a little bit more complicated and nuanced uh, than we might think. For one reason is that the water quality and the state of our rivers varies from place to place. So we can have two river systems that are immediately adjacent to one another. Water quality in one river will be quite good and the water quality in another river might be terrible. And in fact, we can have the same river and water quality will change as we go from upstream to downstream so we can get completely different results. And I can give you a local example of that. Here, we're looking at Richland Creek, which is located in Haywood County. The orange area on the map is the town of Waynesville. And in the headwaters of Richland Creek, 
there is a uh, sub basin here refer commonly referred to as Waynesville watershed, it's Allen Creek. And it represents the drinking water supply for the town of Waynesville. Now, since about 2007, uh, we have been monitoring the water quality within this watershed in, in some detail. And one of the things you should recognize is that the watershed itself is all owned by the city. It's completely forested and access to the watershed is actually restricted. There's no development in it. And the watershed actually backs up to or surrounded by other public lands that you see here in green. So as you might expect, the water quality is quite good. And in fact, it's, it's incredibly good. Um, if it wasn't for pathogens coming from local critters, you could drink this water without any problems whatsoever, without any treatment at all. Now, if we go downstream from Allen's Creek and follow Richland Creek through the town of Waynesville and into uh, Lake Junaluska, which you see here, um, things get a little bit worse. They're certainly not terrible by any means, but we've had an increase of phosphorus and, and nitrogen and other nutrients. There's more debris in the stream channels, plastics, tires, metal, those kinds of things. Uh, pathogens such as E. coli and whatnot have increased somewhat. And so we'll All right, we're back. Technical problems here. Apologize for that. Sometimes this happens with Zoom, I guess. So uh, as I was mentioning, the, the water quality has declined slightly as it flows from uh, the Allen Creek, Waynesville watershed area through the town of Waynesville and into Lake Junaluska. So we can be monitoring water quality and looking at water quality in two separate places along the stream, same stream system and get very different values uh, as a result of that a result of changes that take place as we go downstream. Now we're somewhat fortunate here in the Southern Appalachians that most of our streams are actually headwater streams and they haven't had a lot of opportunity to become contaminated. And so they tend to be on average a lot better than they are in many other parts of the state. Now, with regards to whether our water quality is getting better or worse, the the answer is kind of complicated by the time frame over which we're actually looking. So, so time frame is relatively important. And I want to try to illustrate this with this schematic uh, diagram or chart that I put on here. And what we're essentially doing is plotting uh, the levels of a contaminant, a chemical contaminant in the water through time. And our time frame down here is from several hundred years ago kind of through the Industrial Revolution up through the 1970s into the present day. And what you can see is that water quality initially, several hundred years ago, was very good in the area. It was quite good. Um, and for many of the reasons that Tom just talked about, that changed fairly dramatically 
with the onset of the industrial revolution and in our area around the 1800s uh, up through the early 1900s. Uh, some of the reasons for this is that we had a higher densities of individuals along the stream channel. We didn't necessarily have the same attitudes towards how to take care of those waters as they did in the past. In fact, we often used them as somewhat of a natural sewer system. And the things that we were putting into the waters tend not to break down or be as biodegradable as those in the past. So we had things like hydrocarbons and uh, plastics and a variety of other uh, materials. And then after um, the 19, late 60s, 70s, things had gotten so bad uh, that with the intensity of the environmental movement uh, growing and with the implementation of a whole variety of different regulations, things got better. And so water quality improved on in general, although certainly it depended on which stream you were looking at, uh, but it hasn't returned to the conditions that we had several hundred years ago. All right, so our time frame makes a difference. Um, in our area, I kind of want to focus in on this period where things got pretty bad uh, here in the southern Appalachians. And although chemical contaminants were important, perhaps the more significant contaminant was actually sediment. And this was related to a complete change in the overall landscape that we had. So during the late 1800s, early 1900s, clear cutting occurred throughout the region. Uh, this resulted in massive amounts of upland erosion, the creation of gullies, as you can see here in this lower right-hand slide. And with that, the influx of massive amounts of sediment into our local stream systems. Now, sediment is a, not necessarily a chemical contaminant, but it's a physical contaminant. It can bury the biota and benthic organisms on the bed of the, chain, of the channels. It can smother those organisms. They provide food for fish. The sediments can also clog the gills of fish and cause a wide variety of other problems and can actually modify uh, fish habitats fairly dramatically. Now to give you an idea of how significant this was, I've, I've thrown this picture in. What we're looking at is a stream channel and here we see a buried stump. That stump has been cut off here that you can see and then it is actually been covered over by about six feet of sediment. There was so much sediment coming into the channel that it completely filled in the channel and abraded and covered the floodplain by several feet of material. In the upper right hand slide, you can also see that we have a sycamore tree. The roots here were at one time down here. This is the surface of the earth and it's been filled in by uh, several, several feet. And then down here, we actually have a split rail fence that's been buried. So the influx of this massive amount of material, with re, uh, which was related to uh, this clear cutting and how we kind of changed the entire landscape, uh, caused really dramatic impacts on water quality and overall riverine health. Now associated with that is that we also had a number of mills and mill ponds uh, there weren't as many of those in the southern Appalachians as there was in the Piedmont, um, but in some places there were hundreds of these mills that existed. You can see a map here. This is actually from uh, Maryland, but you can see there was just mill after mill along some of these streams, and those mill ponds filled in with debris. They inhibited uh, fish migration and other biota from moving up and down the stream systems and had a pretty uh, significant impact. Now things got so bad that during the early 1920s, um, we had the passage of several laws, including Clark McNary Act, which then allowed for the creation of our forest uh, systems in the area, reforestation of many of the upland zones. And this really did help decline uh, or reduce the amount of sediment which was uh, going into the stream systems and helped uh, improve overall uh, riverine health and water quality. Now, as I mentioned, chemical contaminants in the Southern Appalachians wasn't important, although it certainly locally was. Um, and in some places it could be pretty dramatic. Now, I, I like to use this example. Uh, it actually comes from Cleveland, it's the Cuyahoga River. 
but it gives you an idea of how bad things were on some river systems. And um, the text down there comes from an article that was published in Tally Magazine in 1969. And uh, I'll just read it briefly. It says, some river, chocolate brown, oily, bubbling with subsurface gases, it oozes rather than flows. Anyone who falls into the Cuyahoga doesn't drown, he decays. The lower Cuyahoga has no visible life, not even lower forms such as leeches and slug worms that usually thrive on wastes. In fact, it was so bad, it had so much hydrocarbons within the water that it caught on fire and burned for several days. And the temperatures of the fire were so hot that it actually melted railroad tracks that you can see there on the left hand side and damaged the bridges and the tracks. So we can kind of get an idea how bad our water quality in many rivers and streams were at that time. It was also recognized at about this time uh, the impact of some other chemical contaminants such as DDT, which was brought to life by the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And so with all of these problems kind of emerging in the intensification of the environmental movement, we had uh, several laws that were put in place to try to improve things. Uh, that included the um, development of the EPA in 1972, which was signed into to power by an executive order, and then the passage of the Clean Water Act. Now, the Clean Water Act was somewhat unique in that it not only pertained to or attempted to maintain water quality of our drinking water supplies, but it was um, enacted to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters as a whole, including our streams and rivers. So it was one of the first pieces of legislation that was really geared to improving uh, just our water quality in streams and rivers in general. We also had passage of the Resource Recovery and Conservation Act. You'll hear this referred to as RECRA. This really tried to um, provide a better series of guidelines on how we should deal with hazardous waste. And, and how it affected rivers is, what, is that it governed what types of waste could be released into river systems and try to kind of control the amount of contaminants that actually uh, entered uh, streams. And then the, the third piece of uh, significant piece of legislation, I think, was the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. This is more informally known as Superfund. And this gave the EPA the authority and resources to clean up the most contaminated river systems. In fact, some of the largest Superfund sites in the country uh, are rivers that have been contaminated um, by mines or things like PCB in the case of the Hudson River. So with these rules, they're certainly not perfect, but with the implementation of these different pieces of legislation, things began to get better. In fact, what we're looking at in these pictures is the Cuyahoga River today, which at one time had no life in it and is now teeming with various types of fish, bass, walleye, pike, and so forth, and is extensively used for utilization. So there are certainly examples where we have gotten better uh, in some locations. And I think that trend's kind of overall trend is probably true. Um, although, like I mentioned, it probably, we probably haven't gotten back to where we were at one time. Now, so far I've been kind of talking in generalities. Um, there are a number of programs that are in existence to try to more quantitatively determine the state of our rivers and, and uh, river water quality. Uh, these are overseen by the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. EPA and various state agencies. Uh, I don't want to bog us down with a whole variety of statistics and facts, but I thought I'd take a few minutes to discuss uh, some of the data from one of these programs, and it's uh, the National Water Quality Inventory. And this is a program that's um, conducted in large part by the states and tribal units and other entities. Uh, in cooperation with the US EPA. Uh, there's really two parts to this. It's kind of changed over the years. The first part here is called the Targeted Site-Specific Monitoring Program. This is the one that's been around for a long time. 
Uh, it's an actual requirement of the uh, Section 305B and 303D of the Clean Water Act, if that makes any difference. It essentially requires states and other entities to report to the EPA on the current state of their waters, as well as those river systems which are currently impaired. Uh, each state develops their own methods for determining and assessing water quality. Uh, it also tries to determine what's causing the degradation, and then that information is passed on to the EPA on a two-year basis. Now, one of the problems with this method on a national scale is that each state uh, has their own methods, and so we can't compare the data from one state to another very easily. And so as a result, uh, more recently, we've developed this other program that you see here. It's the uh, National Stream, River and Stream Resource Surveys. Uh, these data from a scientific perspective are much better. The data are kind of randomly selected. They're kind of more unbiased. Uh, they're collected using the same protocols everywhere. And so they give us a better way of really assessing how water quality changes, not only on a on, uh, within a given state, but within an eco-region or the entire nation. Now, the, the most recent data that's been published uh, comes from a survey that was done in 2008 and 2009. Um, the survey involved 85 different field crews that analyzed about 2,000 different uh, river systems in reaches along those rivers. This accounted for about 1.2 million miles of stream channel. To give you an idea uh, of how extensive this was, we have about 3.5 million uh, miles of stream channel in the U.S. So we analyzed about a third of the existing rivers and streams that are currently out there. And then in terms of data, um, they collected uh, information on really four different groups of indicators. So they looked at biological data, chemical, physical, and human health data. And then they compiled this information to rank each system uh, in terms of whether it was in good condition, fair condition, or poor condition. And this is kind of a brief summary of that. What we see in the upper uh, left-hand corner here is on a national scale, about 46.1% of the analyzed stream channels were in poor condition, about a quarter were in fair condition, and a little over a quarter were in good condition. If we look at the Eastern Highlands, this darker green uh, area here, which includes the Southern Appalachians, again, we see about half is in poor condition and only about a quarter is in good condition. So um, a lot of our streams are fairly impaired if you uh, look at this information. Now, another thing I like about this particular survey is that we can actually focus in on individual parameters and see what's kind of causing the degradation of those stream waters. And what this kind of complex chart's showing us is that things like phosphorus in the middle chart here, the red bar, and nitrogen uh, are really affecting uh, significant numbers of stream channels or reaches that were examined. Um, and phosphorus and nitrogen causes a problem called eutrophication. It's kind of an excess or rapid growth in biota and causes a kind of gives water a bad taste and those kinds of things. So um, it, these nutrients were uh, one of the main problems that were affecting streams here in the Southern Appalachians. There are a couple of things that surprised me. Um, we commonly think of sediments as being one of the most important contaminants here in, in the mountains, and yet uh, stream, set, uh, stream bed sedimentation really wasn't identified as a uh, significant problem. It only affected about uh, a little over 10% of the streams that were analyzed. Same with acidification. We have some of the highest rates of acid rain uh, in the country. Certainly acidification has been recognized as a problem for water quality in Smoky Mountain National Park. We've done a lot of research on acidification there. And yet uh, overall it was identified as a, a relatively minor problem here. 
The other thing I should mention is these uh, overall rating does not include the human health component to this. And so I've thrown that in on this slide. And essentially we're looking at uh, an indicator of pathogens, mainly uh, types of coliform, which would be associated with human and animal wastes that are released into streams. And you can see that these types of coliform uh, or pathogens affect about a third of the streams which were analyzed here in the Southern Appalachians. Um, you know, impact as much as about 125,000 miles of, of channel, so fairly significantly. Okay, so if we go back to this chart, what we're, we're left with is that currently, um, we have some streams that are in good condition, a lot of streams, about 50% or so that are uh, in poor condition, some in between. And the question then becomes, how do we keep streams which are in relatively good shape from getting degraded? And how do we improve those degraded streams? How do we uh, make those degraded streams and raise the overall water quality that are in, in them? Um, there's a whole uh, probably semester's worth of material that we could use to go into that, uh, the answer to that question. Um, but I want to focus in on kind of one general approach. It's referred to as uh, stream or river restoration. Um, this is kind of very loosely defined as the return or the attempt to return a degraded riverine ecosystem to a more natural state something that's more productive from kind of an ecological perspective. Uh, river restoration really began in earnest in the 1990s and it's grown uh, exponentially since the 1990s. Um, it currently is about a billion dollar per year industry. In North Carolina, we spend millions of dollars on stream restoration on a yearly basis. A lot of this is driven by requirements in the Clean Water Act. So if you're a developer or if you're constructing a road and you impact some stream channel, you're gonna to have to actually conduct restoration on an equal uh, amount of stream channel, length of stream channel somewhere else. And so it's this kind of a, a mitigation program uh, that's required by law. And this also applies to wetlands. Uh, in North Carolina, a lot of this is overseen by uh, the North Carolina Division of Mitigation Services, who I think do a fairly decent job. And these programs range from everything from the complete reconstruction of the stream channel that you see in those upper slides uh, to the uh, implementation of various types of bank treatments to try to limit the erosion and influx of sediments from bank erosion to the uh, implementation of uh, riparian corridors, improvement in riparian vegetation along the, the margins of the channel, to the use of conservation easements. Uh, so it restricts the use of uh, those areas right along this channel so that they do a better job of filtering out contaminants, you keep cattle out of the, of the streams and so forth. So uh, I think these programs, um, are having some beneficial effects. The results are mixed depending on where they're applied. Uh, it's still a relatively new field of study and so we're kind of learning on how to do it. And not all of them are as effective as we would like to be, uh, but it's certainly one approach that can be taken to try to improve overall stream health. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of this is uh, driven by uh, government agencies and so forth, uh, but not all of it. And certainly there are a wide range of grassroots organizations in our area that you can become involved with that will uh, do some types of stream restoration. These organizations do more than that though. There's, they do everything ranging from education to um, uh, kind of citizen uh, science to uh, various types of litter cleanup and a variety of other things. So. I think if you're interested in trying to improve river and river health, uh, this is one way you can certainly do it, is get involved with these organizations and volunteer. They're always looking for volunteers and help. And uh, most big watersheds in the area certainly have 
of these opportunities. The last thing I'll leave you with here is just kind of a reminder that it's our responsibility to take action. So whether it's uh, ways to try to limit our pesticide and herbicide use so that it doesn't get into our local waters, um, whether it's trying to pick up trash around storm drains so it doesn't flow into our streams or limit the amount of erosion that occurs on our own property, I think it's our responsibility. And the last comment I'll make here is that um, I think what our own attitudes here uh, could be changed a little bit and uh, we could learn a lot from what Tom mentioned in terms of the Cherokees traditions and how they treat water and view water. And so I'm really happy to be part of this uh, presentation here where we can kind of integrate different thoughts and ideas. Uh, and I think that's the way we need to move forward in, in the future. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miller. Um, that was uh, very good, uh, very enlightening, and it, it's good to understand a little bit more about how these things work um, and also how we can become involved. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, particularly helpful for folks who um, have children uh, I know that many of these organizations have activities for children to be involved. And I think, you know, as, as Tom hopefully would support, it, it, that's where we secure our future, is having children involved in these efforts, understanding how these systems work, and having an education that's experiential that allows them to understand the significance of being um, involved and aware of the health of our resources. Um, I remember uh, growing up um, in large part here in Jackson County, um, we had a um, paper plant here in the middle of town and the um, creek that runs into the main river that goes, goes uh, went along uh, toward where I live, the Tuckasegee, uh, Scotts Creek, uh, was the creek that ran by the, the paper plant. And uh, when it fed into the Tuckasegee, uh, below that, it was just black as it could be with little white caps, you know. And people used to say, well, you could cure a dog's mange if you just threw them in there. You know, I hate, hate to do that for the dog, but um, but of course, um, with the EPA regulations and, and a lot of the things that you talked about that was going on in Ohio and the rest of the country, uh, they were mandated to, to clean it up or leave. Well, they left, uh, but they did, uh, there were efforts to, to have the river and the creeks cleaned up. And fortunately, um, everything has uh, revitalized here. Um, but it just makes you very, very aware of how important it is for all of the life forms, not just us, but all of the life forms uh, to um, have these clean waters uh, and be vigilant uh, about keeping them clean. Um, our, our last speaker, Tommy uh, Cabe, evidently is having some technical difficulties so he's not going to be able to join us. So I thought um, before we get to the few questions that we have and we want to, um, is there anything, uh, Tom or Jerry, that you would like to, any final thoughts that you would like to share uh, with, with the participants that we have? Um, I, I don't have anything to say that, you know, that, to talk about, but I'd be glad to certainly uh, talk about the questions and maybe direct some more extensive thoughts towards some of those questions that come up, so. All right, uh, Pam, if you would go ahead and uh, ask and then Tom, remember that you're on mute, so unmute yourself. 
Okay, uh, we have three questions so far. And Tom Belt, there is a question. There's actually two questions for you if you wanna go to the Q&A box and take a look at those. But I think if we can start with Jerry, uh, there's a question for you from Jim. He asks, with the recent removal of environmental laws restricting waste emissions into US waterways by the current administration, have you been able to document or are you aware of detrimental effects on local waterways in Western North Carolina? Uh, it's a little bit out of my area, but as far as I, me personally, I have not witnessed that yet. I think if um, the monitoring programs that we have in place at the state level would we'll certainly identify those areas over the next year or two and see if there are uh, major changes in, in water quality that result from that. Here in the, here in the mountains, again, that I think one of the, um, the most significant contaminants that we deal with on a regular basis are sediments coming from development uh, road construction and those kinds of things. And then the second one is nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen off agricultural fields, uh, lawns and, and whatnot, and those impacts on water quality. I don't think those particular types of contaminants are gonna be infected, affected to a great extent by the changes in the regulations. It's more the chemical contaminants that would be impacted by that. Okay, um, Tom, the next question for you, um, and forgive me on my pronunciation of a Cherokee word, uh, but I'll try to phonetically say it. Um, the question comes from Matthew. He asks, what is the explanation behind Amgudizgi being described as flexible falling, since we are talking about grammatically, grammatical elements at play? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to say that word again. I'm not for sure. Let me uh, spell it out. It's A-M, and then the next word is G-O-D-O-O-S-G-V-I. Okay. If you can do that again, I just found a pen. M-A, uh, A-M-A. It's A-M, and then the next word is G O D O O. S G V I. Uh, and what is the explanation behind that word as termed flexible falling? Uh, oh, um, Yeah, I'm not, uh, <laughs> uh, you kind of got me on that one. I, I don't know, I'd have to look at it, but let's see. Um, okay. Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, oh, I know where that comes from. That is Amagado scheme. Uh, Way off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, Amagado scheme means uh, water that's falling in a flexible form. I mean, water that's falling, but it makes water into a flexible uh, um, object. Like um, a waterfall, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's uh, 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 that's one of the words that they use for a uh, waterfall, right? Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to add, um, uh, to um, that I wanted to mention is, is uh, to make sure that we uh, is that um, uh, if um, if in fact um, 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 when we look at things and we look at the way in which we we uh, consider the importance of water and the thing that I was talking about a while ago about it being an ancient element um, um, geology um, has has uh, you know, has 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 uh, validated the fact that the uh, that 
that the uh, uh, mountain range here, the um, Eastern Highlands, and I would assume that that uh, takes in not only the Appalachians, but the Alleghenies and all the way up uh, the uh, coast. But this mountain range here, um, and we are talking about the Appalachians, the Appalachians too, is that are the oldest mountain range, um, is the oldest mountain range on the face of the earth. Um, that would uh, logically mean that these waterways that we have here, like, um, and 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 uh, in fact, it has been um, uh, it has been um, pointed out that the new river up here, just a little north of us in uh, Virginia, is is in fact uh, I you know. I, uh, uh, with the name, <laughs> it's kind of ironic that the uh, new new river is actually the oldest river on the face of the earth. But that also means then that the other rivers here, the Tuckasegee, for example, um, can't be um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> can't be much younger than that. In fact are about the uh, all might have happened to all kind of at the same time um, came into being at the same time. What I'm saying is that we have to understand that these mount that these uh, water system and these waterways we have here in uh, the uh, southern Appalachians are the oldest waterways on the face of the earth. So it isn't just speculation. It isn't just a, a cultural point of view. We know that scientifically, these that these water would be uh, these are the oldest uh, freshwater ways on the face of the earth, and they are ancient. And uh, which um, which I wanted to add to what our people were saying about how we considered how important that they were because they were much older than anything else, and uh, they needed to be uh, and our responsibility was to steward not only uh, uh, not only these waterways, but uh, um, the uh, biological um, aspect of the very land that we live on in, I mean, in every aspect of it. That's the importance of, you know, that's why we call it sacred. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, um, thank you, Tom. We have another question um, for you. It's from Lauren. She asked, did the Cherokee continue the tradition of going to the water each morning when they arrived in Indian territory? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, Lauren has a, another question, our last question so far, um, or left. She asks, are there programs that are currently employing Cherokee traditional ecological knowledge to restore the local watersheds? Um, uh, as uh, Jerry pointed out, uh, some of the local conservation groups uh, have joined with, um, with uh, programs uh, with the Eastern Band, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Tommy Cabe uh, and uh, other people who are involved in um, in uh, in uh, those fields for the Eastern Band would, would have more information on it. But uh, um, uh, a lot of the uh, conservancy groups, I mean, a few of the conservancy groups like Mainspring and and other groups, as uh, Jerry said, uh, have joined with the Eastern Band in uh, in um, having summer programs or they were doing that on you know until um, the recent developments with COVID were uh, having uh, summer programs that had to deal with um, with uh, uh, not only the waterways and the rivers and importance of it but also with things like um, 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 bird life and uh, those 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 kind of things so those things had started and I'm fairly certain that probably in the um, in the future uh, programs with the Eastern Band that deal with the uh, leadership things are also probably going to be involved in those kinds of things. That's 
good to hear. Okay, um, that's the end of our Q&A. We had six questions and they were answered. So if no one else has any questions, I'll give it back to you, Lisa. Okay, since we have just a little, a little bit of time left. We have one more come in. I'm sorry, oh, okay. Lisa. Sure, yeah. It's for Tom. Um, from Matthew, Mr. Belt, are there any idioms about water in the language? Uh, well, I can't think of any right off hand. <laughs> uh, um, 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 I, 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 I'm sorry, I just can't think of any just right off hand. Like, I don't have to be really specific. Then, so. Okay. Well, thank you all, and, and thanks, Pam, for fielding those questions. Um, since we have just uh, a few minutes, uh, I thought I would just um, give folks kind of an idea of some of the participants, the uh, people who will be talking at the, the two-day rooted meeting in April. Um, of course, we'll have Tom Belt uh, coming back. Uh, to, to talk. We also will have uh, Dr. Tom Hatley, who was, uh, used to be the Sequoia uh, Distinguished Professor here at, at WCU in Cherokee Studies. Um, but uh, he and uh, some of his guest panelists, uh, Callie Moore and, and others in the region, will be talking about river conservation in Western North Carolina. Um, our own Kim Hall, who is a faculty member in environmental uh, sciences, health sciences here at WCU, will be talking about granting legal personhood to bodies of water. And of course, this is a very important topic, particularly among indigenous uh, people. Uh, there has been a movement in order to save bodies of water um, as, as Tom spoke of about uh, the rivers being referred to as the long person, um, that there should be um, uh, legal uh, means in which to protect these bodies of water. Uh, we will have a, another panel uh, organized by uh, Jessica Corey and Mae Claxton here at WCU in the English department uh, um, about what has been written, uh, what, writing about water in Appalachia. And again, this is important because we do want uh, a broad interdisciplinary perspective uh, in talking about water and how it impacts us in many, many ways. Uh, Dr. Miller will be back uh, talking with us uh, about his continued research uh, regarding rivers uh, in, the, in the region. Then we hope at, uh, in the evening, that, that uh, Thursday evening, we will have a native food supper as we have historically done uh, on campus so that we can network and uh, get to know one another a little bit better. Then on the second day, we will do a field trip to the Tuxedo River at Isla Port and uh, hopefully Tom and a couple of the elders that usually help us out during this period uh, will be talking to us about um, the river. Uh, then we will have a, a couple of folks from the Eastern Band of Cherokee uh, in their water resources, natural resources, uh, Mike Lavoie and Doug Reed, who uh, is basically has the responsibility of uh, keeping uh, water control uh, quality there with the Eastern Band, speaking about the issues that they deal with. Uh, and then Elaine Eisenbraun, uh, who is uh, program director for the Nequasi Initiative in Macon County. Uh, she has uh, had a long career of working with uh, uh, water conservation groups uh, and other groups, and we will be talking about um, the Tennessee River uh, in Macon County and uh, the Nequasi Mound and that region and the initiatives that are uh, associated with those. 
Uh, Tommy Cabe will be back, hopefully, in person uh, to talk about what uh, Natural Resources uh, is doing uh, to help um, preserve uh, the flora and fauna uh, and the waterways. Uh, they are very involved in the um, TEK movement uh, and they'll be uh, working to uh, talk to us more about what is it that the tribe is doing to help uh, preserve and conserve um, both water and the plants and other things that are involved in those systems. Um, so those are some of the folks and, and not all of them, but some of them that will be involved in some of the topics that will be addressed uh, at Rooted in the Mountains if we are able to attend uh, in April. And uh, if not, then we'll have to see about how we're gonna uh, hopefully manage the technology to provide a, uh, something uh, in a different venue. Um, but I really appreciate everyone uh, coming and uh, appreciate the participants' questions. Uh, and uh, thank you to the speakers, both Dr. Miller and Tom, for uh, sharing your expertise. And uh, um, we hope that uh, we'll see you again in the spring and um, um, I hope that all of you will check back on the Western Carolina University uh, homepage. Uh, just do a search for Rooted in the Mountains. Uh, registration information should be available there. So uh, be sure to register early uh, and that way we'll know what we need to deal with when the time comes to decide what, we, what to do. So um, thank you all. We really appreciate this and uh, appreciate your patience, uh, but also appreciate the valuable information uh, that was shared today. And we are so grateful to have uh, your expertise and, and your contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye y'all. Thank you, bye.